and never ever it did exist right in front of our very eyes then one day Allah decided to help us and you must give us a nudge towards advancement and then helped us move towards the next level of our evolution of our advancement so in one of them far distant days Allah caused a lightning to start a fire in a forest and humans were petrified at that moment at the sight of this new comer into their lives it was a phenomenon a human could not explain at that time they thought the divine God is angry with us and then they realized that this God is capable through this kind of lightnings and this kind of natural disasters to strike and punish us and to destroy us but that was not the purpose as to why Allah caused the forest to get burnt that fear from fire still exists within us today when we hear lightning we always think of the end of our species that has never will never disappear without the intervention of Allah humans would never ever have discovered fire this is why in Surah Al-Waqi'ah that is the Surah number 56 Allah talks to us about these great blessings from him he said tell me what about the fire that you produce that you use every day you don't even think about it is it you who originated its tree or are we the originator and then he says i.e. the fire we have made the fire a reminder Allah made fire as a reminder of the fire of hell fire to give us an idea what the fire of hell should be like and then he said and I comfort the fire also is for the needy travelers and we on earth today all of us are travelers to the hereafter my dear sisters and my brothers humans have then created since then incredible myths about demons spitting fire or giving meanings to dreams containing fire as a clear prediction of bad luck they said and some of them said that upon lightning fire it refused if you light a fire and it refuses to draw in that's because the demon the satan the shaitan is there and is taking control so what they used to do they used to take a rod made of iron and they would draw a cross on whatever they're trying to light the fire on and that cross was acting as if Jesus was there to chase the demon today people have not changed much today they say cross your finger what they mean by that is that you make the sign of the cross which is a religious goodness to chase away whatever bad luck exists today not Nothing has much changed since the dawn of when we humans came to exist and then after that humans kept on creating different superstitions for different things a superstition is nothing else but an explanation given to something that humans do not understand and because something happened after something then they say oh if you open an umbrella inside the house then this should be then that's it and then it becomes a superstition if you walk under a ladder then this even will if a black cat crosses in front of you then this why is it that because someday something happened and then another bad thing happened and they linked the, the two together and came to the existence that is superstitious and then welcome to the world of crystals but let's first agree on what we are talking about here what am I talking about in the world of crystals crystals that I'm on about are those minerals formed underground 
And I remember when I was young, I used to live in a city that was a big mine. And for that, there used to be tons of crystals. I used to, as a matter of fact, collect crystals, not because of some belief or some of the energy or things like that, but it's just because they looked absolutely fantastic. And I've, and I've had, and back home now, I've got some of my crystals, they're still there, and they are absolutely gorgeous. One day when I was in Hawaii on, on the island of Maui, I saw this gigantic uh, crystal that costed $450,000. It's just a crystal, mind-blowing crystal. And that is just what Allah can create. And they just took a portion of it and it costed $450,000 for it. So I'm talking about that kind of crystal. Again, when humans, it's incredible how we humans have evolved. It is only later on, my sisters and my brothers, that when I lived in California, that I met with the so-called strange crystally people, people that believed in crystals. I've even seen houses built with crystals because of this crystal healing. And I refer here to the people who swear by crystals hidden healing powers. That the crystal itself, that rock, has got some hidden healing powers and today it's promoted throughout the world that a crystal can bring in some form of healing energy balancing, linking the body, mind, soul, and all that kind of stuff together. And because of the absolute gorgeous shapes and looks these rocks have, they give you some very unexplained feelings. You look at a crystal, look at it, try let your emotions do the job, and you're gonna experience some incredible feelings. If someone asks you to define and explain these feelings, you won't be. It's something you feel, but you cannot express. And that is the power of the beauty in the rock. It's got nothing to do with the energy. Now let's go on and, and, and carry on, okay? A crystal's appearance, my dear sisters and my brothers, depends upon what magical characteristics Allah has built within it. And I say magical. Because what Allah has put in there, once you look at the crystal, you completely lose the ability to remain a human. You become a top emotional human right in front of one of the most beautiful creation of Allah, crystal. It's not at all amazing or surprising that a small piece of diamond can cost millions of pounds or dollars because it's the crystal in it. It's that beauty that Allah has built within that element, that creation. Crystals like humans grow in different environments and for that they will have different sizes, different shapes, different characteristics. Some crystals take on very strange shapes. Some are very small and others grow very large. Some develop over years and some develop over thousands of years. Others develop over millions of years. If you ever find yourself in a crystally environment, you will feel it within you. And you will feel the long time since the birth of humanity until our time. SubhanAllah, crystals, the way you look at them, they will transport you to some kind of very far and very remote places and times. And you feel that the, once you connect with a crystal, you feel there is a very ancient calling. You can't explain it, but you will certainly find yourself captured by a submerging feeling. You hear a silent voice carrying you away to some felt, very, very felt and never known places. And if you were asked to express yourself about how you feel when in contact with that, well then guess what? Those absolute gorgeous crystals will just transport you, but you will never ever be able to answer what you are feeling. You will feel some kind of calm inside you, some kind of complete serenity and a, an unspoken and deeply felt spell. Notice how even speaking about crystals creates in you a very strange feeling. And that's the power of hormones. 
I use deliberately these words so that I trigger in you a very set of specific hormones that will help you understand why people who seek crystals for healing do that. It's not the crystals themselves, it's not the rock. It's what makes people, how it makes people feel that makes people believe in those rocks. Notice now how even speaking about those crystals creates a very strange in you. And because I haven't warned you before I started, you just were transported through millions and millions of years with few words about crystals. What about if you stood there right in front of this magnificent creation of Allah? And because of these very unexplained feelings that people experience, and because we humans cannot live without believing into something, Allah has created in us the necessity and the desire to believe. And this is when he said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn and the ins or the humans, except that we should worship. We want to worship something. Humans, we cannot live without the ability to worship. We need to worship something. And because we cannot, humans cannot explain those feelings and those experiences that they go through, we have a tendency of giving an explanation to anything that we cannot explain. We give them any kinds of forms of explanation. And this is what made people invent all these stories about a crystal's power to heal people. People started believing and building some mystical beliefs and started relating to crystals as supernatural and metaphysical words that these guys, they can transport you and do marvels to you. And because speaking about crystals emanates from emotions, like poetry that expresses feelings, crystals were given far more meanings than what they simply are. A silent work of a God who prepared those crystals within the chambers of time. Crystals kept traveling for millions of years till a human being somewhere found them, experienced some strange emotions, some deep strange powerful emotions. Then he thought of them, of them crystals differently, gave them some enigmatical, like some enigma meanings. And because the human mind and intellect is so powerful that words alone can make a human being live or kill themselves. With words you can influence the humans. Just look at yourself when you listen to my talk, how I make you feel with words just when I speak about the ancient calling of crystals. I, can, I could go on and on and on voicing about these very sweet crystals and their looks and characteristics and everything. But the general belief that crystals can do things that they can heal or can be printed with some kind of memory and then regulate some form of energy in a manner that you may hold a crystal in your hands with the intentions of filling it with love which makes people believe that crystals have the power to hold energies and these energies can be used for a variety of healings. You give a crystal to somebody and then that person fills the crystal with love. And then you take the crystal home and suddenly your home is going to shine with love and harmony and energy and all those things. Those who believe in crystals will swear to you and they will tell you that you do not need any special connection with God to program your crystal as you wish. But all you need is intention and focus. Then, as they say, the crystal will remember the love or the harmony or the balance or whatever you program the crystal with. And then guess what? In simple words, the crystal will act as the human is meant to. All you got to do is put in the crystal and you get it out of it later. Then they gave these crystals few other functions, such as cleansing a room of negative 
energies such as anger, dismay, resentment, or whatever feelings, negative feelings that exist in your house. And then the crystal, based on what is programmed to do, will hey, counter those negative energy. In simple words, the crystal will just act as another god in your home. That's it. He does uh, the, the opposite of what you want the world to be like. But anyhow, the crystal versus the stars. And this is very important. You got to understand that the belief in crystals comes from the same bag as the belief in the stars, constellation, and everything else. Uh, humans, we have very powerful imagination. And the best to have, uh, Allah in the Quran has used one particular messenger to fight everything that is uh, celestial and everything that is crystally. Okay? That person is none else but Abraham. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim had a very serious problem with his people. They used to believe that the position and motion of stars and planets and all those celestial bodies, when they moved in the sky, they would affect and influence a human's fate on Earth. They will tell you if Venus crosses path with Saturn and this happens and that happened. Okay, and if your fall, i.e., atom, is aligned with so and so constellation, then this will happen. They will say an outcome, and then people believe in that outcome. Of course, all this is shirk. Shirk to understand exactly what it means. Shirk is to enter in partnership with somebody else. And that's why in Arabic, a business where there is more than a partner is called sharika. Sharika, the moment you say sharika, people understand that you are not the sole owner, but rather people are in partnership. So when we say shirk, we are saying that someone entered in partnership with Allah. That's all it means. So when people give powers to crystals and power to the moon and power to the sun and things like that, what they have done, they made the sun and the moon enter in partnership with Allah in doing certain things that only Allah can do. Let me explain. When we get cold and we want to get warm, the warmth itself is a creation of Allah. How we get the warmth is different. You wear extra clothing, you tuck yourself under the duvet in your bed, you expose yourself to the sun, it don't matter. What it matters is the warmth, the root of the warmth comes from Allah. The means Allah gave us a bigger way. Now, if we believe that it is the sun that gives us the warmth, the initial warmth that Allah has created, then we have made the sun partner with Allah. But if we believe that the sun is nothing else but a tool to help us reach the warmth that Allah has created, then no big problem at all. The same thing, if we believe that the sweater we wear is the one that gives us the warmth, then we have associated our sweater with Allah. But if we believe that the sweater is nothing else but a tool to get warm, to get what Allah has created initially, no problem at all. And this is where the big problem is. And Abraham is the man who brought all those different conflicts to Existence and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not forget that for Ibrahim alayhi salam. Crystals are not different to worshiping than anything else. But what I mean by that? A crystal is a rock, it could also be a statue or even anything else. People believe a variety of different things. Some of them they draw a statue and they worship that statue. Some others they would worship a rock. Some others would worship a tiger, a necklace, or believe in something that will bring you a luck. And then they will treat that thing there as if it were the provider or luck or something that re removes evil or the bad eye or something that can heal you or keep you healthy or something that's gonna just by wearing it you're gonna be all lucky, nothing evil is going to happen to you. Or if you do this, you're going to get rich and things like that. And then people will start looking and valuing those things, those belongings, as if they had special powers. 
even if, and here is the kicker, even if you believe that the book of Al-Quran that carries the words of Allah has got special powers, then you have committed shirk, you have associated a book with Allah. Our belief when we read is the message, the words of Allah, not the book that contains them. So crystals are not different than anything else that people worship besides Allah. They are the same and in the same part. Allah told us in the Quran the story of a people who believed in the powers of planets, stars and constellations. They attributed the good health of people to those bodies. They also attributed those victories of war that they were given by these celestial bodies and these gods and all these people were in complete harmony of course that is untrue but that's what people chose to believe in that's what people formulated their belief around this if, they, if you start thinking that the moon is a god your body will provide and secret and it will produce the hormones that will make you believe that the moon is a god and that's why it's extremely dangerous what kind of hormones you ask your body to produce Allah has said told us the story of a people who believed in the powers of planets stars and constellations and they attributed the good health of people to these bodies and again Ibrahim alayhi salam when he came into in these people he was a man of his own people before going any further I want to say this the crystal healings astrology and all these things are not a science they don't have any facts it is as a matter of fact a pseudoscience and a pseudoscience is any statements or beliefs or practices that you that are claimed by people to be both scientific and factual but are incompatible with the science method that exists today and I'm gonna give you an example we Muslims we are told or we believe is we are told as is in Sahih Muslim and so on and so forth if a fly fell in your glass all you have to do is dip the fly deep inside the glass and then remove the fly and drink why you do that well they say because the messenger of Allah said that when a fly falls into your glass in under one wing it carries the disease and under the other wing it carries the antidote of that disease so you don't since you don't know which of the two wings fell in your glass as if the fly would fall just on one side and not flat on both wings but anyhow uh, and then all you have to do since you don't know on which of the two wings was dipped in your water then you push the the, the animal subhanallah the fly into your glass remove the thing and drink and then what they did they made if you felt like sick from a fly falling in your glass and say I don't want to drink that they will tell you, you are a hypocrite because you don't believe in the messenger of Allah and what he says now is this true absolutely not this is a pseudo science science today they've studied all kinds of flies and they haven't found that the, the disease is under the wings of the fly as a matter of fact the disease is in the in, in the legs and the mouth of the fly that goes and eats and just and up on bad places and it transports the disease to other things so it's got nothing to do with the wings but we the believers we're made to because some scholars Mr. Muslim and then the scholars after him made statements and they established beliefs on that and they did practices and they said that this is scientific so today you hear Muslims telling you all oh, the fly is scientific things like that but as a matter of fact the, all this is incompatible with the science method of finding results and this is characterized, I, I mean the sort of science, by contradictory and uh, contradiction and is often exaggerated. The claims are phenomenally exaggerated. The outcome and results always rely on confirmation or rely on confirmation based on things people experienced rather than in some scientific results and this is one other problem with crystal here for example we humans through the ages discovered the clay to be extremely potent and can heal an injury at an incredible rate 
I personally have used clay on myself, on injuries on myself, staying by myself, or on my children. The results are extremely phenomenal. You're not going to believe use clay, the, the, the pure natural one, okay, the, the unprocessed one. And you're going to, you hurt yourself, you cut yourself open today. Put clay on it today, by tomorrow your wound would be gone. It's incredible, the clay is incredible. One time, one part, uh, somewhere in the past, someone discovered this and they found out some healing powers of the clay and then they used them and then science caught up with them, took clay in the in laboratories, studied clay, found clay to have some extremely beneficial characteristics to the human body. Today, clay is accepted both in the experiment world and the scientific world. Today, it's science, alhamdulillah. And we say, oh, Oh, yeah, Allah, you created this for us. Many thanks for that. And we move on. But if you go to the crystal healings, nothing of that at all. People just claim and say there is nothing substantiated by result. Believing that clay has some physical healing capabilities is not shirk because the fact and results are right in front of our eyes and we believe that the one who gives healing is Allah. The tool is clay, no big problem at all. But when it comes to crystals, there is nothing about them that says that hold any crystal or for spiritual healing powers and blah 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 will get you the result. Otherwise, the medical world would have prescribed crystals for people that are depressed, people that are suicidal. Give them crystal and they feel better. So the act of believing in a rock itself to provide and do is an act of shirk in disguise. The story of Ibrahim with his people is extremely important. And here is why. The people of Abraham السلام, went into the worship of celestial bodies. As in the moon, the sun, Venus, and Jupiter, and all that, what you got, okay? They gave these celestial bodies attributes that only a god can have. Then they invented false gods to manifest the presence of a distant being to help them give a meaning to what they saw. What I mean by that, the moon is right in a celestial body up there, right? But the moon disappears daytime. So if someone wants to worship the moon, how are they going to do that? Well, then they went on and sculpted a god, uh, for, and they called him the moon god or something like that. That moon god is present there 24 hours a day. So if someone wants to worship the mood god at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they can because it is there. But why the real moon is not there? And that's what I mean by people invented these kind of gods to make up for the absence of the other ones. When Ibrahim السلام, was a kid, he was just believing like his own people, Ibrahim. He was not from day one a messenger. Just like his people, he believed in the constellation, believed in this and believed in that. But later on, Ibrahim him got dismayed. Ibrahim was disillusioned. He saw things and to him it was not the way it should run. The world is not just like that. Well then Ibrahim السلام, started behaving differently. Why? Because his people were too much into this crystal world, the celestial world. One day Ibrahim السلام, shook his people with strong evidences that those celestial bodies up there in the heaven and these rocks that you have sculpted and those uh, crystals that you have built were nothing but a creation of nothing. They are not the creation of a much bigger entity as you said like the gods and suns and the moon. Ibrahim told them what you see, the moon, the sun, the skies, everything are as a matter of fact a creation of a higher entity. These people refused that. And because how else will they give meaning to all what they see? And then, haven't they slaughtered humans and animals for hundreds of years for these gods and got from them what they asked for? Haven't they prayed to the gods of the temple and received what they asked for? Wasn't their life saved by these gods? Haven't they spent a lifetime worshipping these gods?
Haven't they done all what they did on those suns, the moon, and all those celestial bodies, and those gods that they sculpted? And as it happens, a member of the family of Ibrahim, السلام, his uncle, was a professional sculptor of these gods. So to Ibrahim, he was concerned from different angles. One of them is it's a money-generating machine. And now Ibrahim, after what his people are experiencing and the norm and the culture, everything was branched and believed that everything was connected with each other. Ibrahim comes a little young man and challenges those beliefs. Ibrahim comes to tell them that he discovered who the true God was. Imagine this. Ibrahim's journey to discovering Allah, my deceases and my brothers, wasn't an easy one. And Allah did not let Abraham down. When the people of Ibrahim revolted against him, what did they do? And now you will understand why Allah tells us the story of Ibrahim when they threw him into fire. Well, as it turns out, when these people wanted to kill Ibrahim, to avenge their gods, to support their gods, because Ibrahim was an entire god, their gods, what they did, they called upon the god of fire or the god of lightning. And usually this god in the Babylonian era was sculpted with, uh, sorry, was sculpted with a uh, dragon. And that dragon was fire spitting dragon. So that's what they did. The name of this man is Marduk. So they called upon the God of fire to burn Ibrahim السلام. And you know what happened? That's why Allah defeated them. He led them through catapult Ibrahim into fire. But Allah deprived that fire from the ability to burn. The God of Ibrahim had defeated the God of the Babylonian. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Ibrahim and kept him alive in their fire. Because the God of fire or lightning at that time was the highest, the chief God of the Babylonian. And Ibrahim السلام, was extremely joyful that he discovered Allah. And that's why it's called the Abrahamic religion, al Islam that we have today. And it is Ibrahim who named us Muslims. He named anyone who uh, believes in Allah is a Muslim. That's him. That's why. You, and it's so wrong to call ourselves today Muslims and the other one Jews, Christians. No, they are Muslim. The Jews are Muslims. The Christians are Muslims. We are Muslims. And anyone who believes in the one God is submitted to the one God. But for the name as a Muslim, it is the Jews, Christians, and us, the believers. We all are Muslim. Ibrahim was extremely ecstatic. He was so joyful to have discovered and found the God. And he was so thrilled and overjoyed. And because Ibrahim was a product, a product of his own people, he saw how his people behaved. His people, whenever they wanted to thank the gods, they would slaughter to them. Sometimes they would slaughter animals. Sometimes they would sacrifice their humans. And Ibrahim السلام, started thinking, what is the best way to show my love and dedication to this true God that I have found, especially after the human's demise at the time of Nuh السلام. Humanity after Nuh السلام, started building itself, and in that construction process, they made the same mistake as their ancestors, forgetting who the true God is, and we still are making the same mistake. Today, people have tendency to forget who the true God is, is and they start following the preachings of Satan that leads them away from their beloved God. Abraham السلام, was a product, as I said, of his own culture, his own people. And because he saw how his people showed the reverence to their gods, he wanted to do the same thing for his newly found God. And that is to slaughter my son. Ibrahim thought about it a lot in himself, so much so that when he went to bed, he started 
started dreaming of slaughtering his son. For example, say you want to buy a car and you want to buy a red Audi, I don't know, an A8 uh, car. Because you think about that a lot, your subconscious will proceed that this thinking that you're doing is important. And at night when you go to sleep, that is when your subconscious files away what you have seen or you have said and you thought throughout the day. And about at night, because your subconscious has judged that that uh, thinking about the car is important to you, what does it do? It runs through you one more time and that's how the dream comes in. Then you start seeing the, the car and then because we are humans who give meanings to anything, when you wake up in the morning you go, oh, since I saw that in the dream, it must be Allah telling me to buy an Audi. But it's not Allah, it's just your subconscious playing a trick and a dirty trick on you. That's exactly what happened to Ibrahim a.s. His people slaughtered humans and animals to show their gratitude and thankfulness to their gods. Ibrahim thought, what is the best way to thank this God who has saved me from the fire? And he thought, giving my son, slaughtering my son is the best of forms. And that's how the dream came to be. And then the more Ibrahim Ibrahim thought about it because he saw it in a dream. He started thinking, oh, since I saw it in a dream, it must be the God who is telling this to me. Again, Ibrahim being a producer of his own people, there were people that used to interpret the will of the gods that tell people, well, if people saw something in the dreams, they would go to those people and these interpreters will tell them what the God says through the dream. Then Ibrahim applied the same error with Allah and guess what Ibrahim decided to slaughter his son and then when he wanted to slaughter his son Allah did not want the humans to be killed for him and that is when Ibrahim was about to slaughter Allah called him Ya Ibrahim you have indeed believed in what you saw in the dream and but we don't want you to slaughter your son and that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him an animal Allah did not precise in the Quran what animal uh, he would send but that is, Allah sent him an animal and that is that Ibrahim alayhi salam later on and openly shared with his Babylonian people the truth about Allah that Allah himself demands, demanded and demands of his subservience and, and anyone who believes in Allah that this truth must be existent in our lives until judgment days. To save on time, I will read my translation of the Arabic meaning from the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Surah that is the Surah 56 from Ayah 69 to 82 and relate to them once more the breaking news of Abraham. So we should pay attention because it's a breaking news. When he said to his father and his people, what is it that you worship? They said, we worship idols and uh, to rub it in in front of his face because they know who Ibrahim is and all the arguments he had be with, with them before, right? So they added this and they say, and we remain to them very devoted. He said, do they hear you when you call upon them or profit you in any way or harm? They said, no, but we have found our father's also doing this and what this means my sister that also is that this act of what them worshiping rocks and celestial bodies and things like that is not something new it is a generational it's generations after generations that they this so it's something that has a long deep root in history Ibrahim salam said do you see those who have been worshiping you and your ancient forefathers they indeed are an enemy to myself with the exception of the world's undertaker God, i.e. Allah. For it is him, and this is what Abraham is going to say now, this is what people in his time believed that the celestial bodies, moon, sun, and the rocks on earth could do. And this is exactly what the crystal healings are told to be doing. Listen to this. And then he said, for it is him, I, Allah, who created me. And that's a fact. And because Allah created you, well, he certainly knows what ails and what works for you, right? Well, and then he says, it is him who shall guide me. 
Guide me here is not only guide us about belief, guiding him and me and you to what ever is going to benefit us who guided us penicillin to penicillin to be beneficial to our body it is allah but anyhow then ibrahim says and it is he i.e allah who nourishes me and waters and when i become sick who heals he heals allah heals and he causes me death then shall revive uh, Allah shall revive us on judgment day and I crave that he forgives me my deliberate sins on judgment day you see how Ibrahim now explains what he's telling his people and his father and his group and the town and his people that you guys believe that those celestial bodies and the rocks that you believe in and you worship that they can nourish and water you it don't happen that if you fall sick it's them to heal you and falling sick here does not mean you've got a flu it could be emotional sickness it could be spiritual sickness it could be physical sickness remember what i said at the beginning the mind the body and the soul so any of these guys that fall sick it is allah not the rocks and why did ibrahim salam crave that allah forgives him his deliberate sins because on judgment day prophets and messengers will be held accountable just like you and i none is guaranteed entrance to paradise not even the messengers in closure to this little i want i so much wanted it to be 10 minutes but it's impossible but i'm gonna say this how does all this uh, crystal healing things like that fit in the religion of allah simply put crystals have been and are being given attributes that only allah can have only god can have beliefs that crystals can do things and you can program them put love in them and they will do that and they will do this from themselves is a form of shirk and shirk as i said in arabic means enter in partnership with allah and that is not true at all believing that a crystal rock or quartz or the moon or whatever that is rocky possesses some healings and mystical powers believing that just because a crystal quartz is in a room then that room's energy can be affected is exactly the same as those who worshipped idols because those who worshipped idols saw that the idols the rocks or their sculpted gods actually did exactly that if they brought their own god into a room the room is protected and it's the energy is good and all that kind of stuff these statues hold some powers that the humans cannot explain that's why they worship them crystals are extremely dangerous and will destroy your religiousness they will destroy your islam and they will make you an associator with allah but 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 if you use them rocks and i mean either crystals or quartz or anything of these guys that look very nice because of their looks or their smell because some of them are very nice smelly or maybe you link an emotion to them for example may i when i went to hawaii uh, in my youth i have this crystal at home when i see it it, ha- it helps me back in memory that is not because i believe that the rock provides that but because it's an anchor back in my memory just like for example when you were a kid you used to dress something red and for the rest of your life whenever you see red you think of your about your childhood no problem with that so if you uh, if you have crystals at home just because they are beautiful to look at and they make the house very nice they are as good as a couch or a good as plant or whatever but the moment you enter them into the world of healing and their ability to do certain and thinks that is the the counter of shirk will trigger i pray to allah that this god i could not it's impossible for me to leave it to 10 minutes but uh, i would give just the first uh, but anyhow so I, i'm really sorry for the length of it but that is it's needed and it deals as you know i, I don't give just a couple of things i bring the issue from different angle to make sure that you hear this and you understand
understand it and you make the best out of it. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us all stay in the right true path of believing in Allah and Allah alone correctly as Allah intends. And until my next talk, uh, you stay in the mercy of Allah. This is again your brother Abdus Salam Abu Hanifa or Abdus Salam Ben Daud. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.